thank you, Yancy, and and thanks to um, just the invitation and uh, hello to all the guests who are here. So just to kickstart um, the discussion, I I'm 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 not going to be talking. Uh, engagements uh, around politics and so on. But it is important that I think when we have a dialogue, uh, we have every set of voices coming to talk about what are the challenges and how we can resolve them. I think South Africans have been going through the most uh, for the last couple of years. And uh, it is important that, you know, we should have our trademark uh, character, which is to talk. Uh, and it's important that when we discuss how we can have uh, these solutions that can uh, alleviate this challenge uh, so that, you know, it's it's solved uh, for good. We don't end up in this situation again. And for that, I think it's important to hear from different voices. And uh, it so happens this particular week, it has been uh, very hectic for me. Uh, and on another set of dialogue, uh, we had quite a number of heads. It's amazing that when we meet in that fashion, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of agreement and common ground. And that's when you begin to appreciate the fact that uh, the more we can engage with civil society, with NGOs, um, with private sector, with basically everyone South African, then we begin to find some common ground on where we can take the country. Um, without any waste of time, uh, let me just start with uh, just a number of things that I just want to maybe highlight. And this is going to be my focal area. I think... Uh, quite a lot is being said on the crisis from the supply side. Uh, there's another challenge to it, of course, from the demand side. And uh, perhaps little said about the demand side is where uh, your average South Africans are feeling the pain. And uh, whatever solutions that we're proposing, and we want to fix ESCOM, uh, but there is a chance that some of the solutions that are brought up can leave some of the communities behind. Uh, particularly when you consider what you know people pay for electricity as things stand. So the 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 whole issue of how do we grow the economy, it, it obviously requires energy. And I think I've had some of the conversations uh, earlier about how there is a clear correlation between energy and economic growth that uh, certainly go hand in hand. I think to take it a step further, I would say that we cannot solve South Africa's problems without solving them where they are uh, where they are expressed harshly and this is you know in townships and rural areas where uh you talk about you know there being load shedding there are communities that you know go through um weeks without electricity when there's no load shedding happening and uh it's because you know they're lacking uh they are they're just not being uh considered to have reliable electricity coming through to their um households so to truly solve this crisis it's going to require us to also solve it where it, it persists the most, and that is in townships and in rural areas. So as I mentioned, there's the supply side, which um, again, quite a number of speakers here have really outlined, and I'll try not to take too long uh, just to go through a number of these issues. Um, for the last 30 days, we have gone without any load shedding, and, and in some corners, you can see people feeling more confident that it looks like we're out of the woods. I think that is very far from it. And I was quite happy to hear the Minister of Electricity also having the same um, posture of saying, you know, we're not yet out of the woods, uh, even though, you know, it's been a very good 30 days for South Africa to go without load shedding. Uh, and, and part of the challenge is this, is that when ESCOM is running at its best, it requires to also have about 15% in reserves. So right now we are not even close to operating in that space. And, and that is why we keep falling back into load shedding schemes or having to ban a lot of diesel, which then economically makes uh, how running ESCOM becomes untenable. So it is fairly important to be able to say we are out of the woods when everything checks. Uh, from a technical side, it means we, we, we maintain that 15% reserve. Um, and also it means that uh, we are able to reach the allowable uh, or the required um, energy availability factor, uh, which, you know, in, in around the 2000s, it used to be fairly high, um, somewhere going upward of even 70. So it is important to be able to maintain those on a technical side as part of resolving the supply side. But part of the background is that, you know, what got us here, amongst other things, is the fact that there's been... Uh, the model of the energy market that we have adopted, which 
there was a time when ESCOM had an opportunity to engage on uh, opening up the market. And obviously, there was resistance from other corners of the Tri-Party Alliance. Um, but that, including things like the delays that uh, of the two big power stations in Midupi and Kusile, have, have contributed significantly to where we are sitting now with challenges of load shedding. But to say it is only technical would be really missing the point. Part of what got us to this crisis is the fact that there are elements of corruption and, and we see corruption being so endemic. These tentacles are really reaching everywhere. And, and I like what Jabu, uh, Mr. Jabu, the late Mr. Jabu Mabuza said when he said, the name is corruption, but the game is procurement. And it's, it's because there are elements um, of criminality, eminent elements of corruption that have really brought us into the space. And to truly solve this crisis is not only going to take the technical considerations, it will also take the sort of leadership that we are putting uh, in place. And I think all of these things are some of the major issues that probably will need uh, resolving by the government. Um, I had uh, Chris Yellen talking about uh, this instability that comes from the two centers of power where uh, from a policy direction, uh, we are not sure whether we are taking cues from DMRE or from the Presidential Climate Commission. Sometimes they they speak uh, in contradicting terms. And uh, the, the Presidential Climate Commission, it's something that sort of like sneaked in um, during the, uh, when we were going through the COVID period. And, and, and I mean, there's some articulations coming there that are very, very helpful. Uh, but I think the moment you do not have uh, policy uncertainty, it will continue to destabilize um, our energy projections, how we are resolving the energy challenges and the crisis uh, at large. So it's fairly important that there should be some sort of a, um, alignment as far as these uh, positions are concerned so that you don't end up hearing you know, differing elements from uh, two very critical parts of government. But as I said, I'm, I'm interested in, in focusing on the demand side. And uh, part of the reason for that is because uh, there are communities and, you know, it's large population of South Africans that are likely to continue to experience the crisis. Mpo, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I can't hear you. Hello? Yes, that's better. Uh, yes, oh, okay. My apologies. I don't know. It seems to have faded. Okay. Um, Thank right. you. Right, so I was, I was saying that, so what interests me the more, more is the demand side of the crisis for electricity. And this has been expressed with... Um, uh, municipalities like in Jobet, you know, talking about high levels of indebtedness with uh, Soweto, as an example, owing uh, close to about 80 billion rands uh, to the municipality. Of course, not all of it is for electricity, but this does uh, paint a picture of the magnitude of challenges that we have as a result of this crisis being expressed in a different form. Um, I think it doesn't help with the fact that the, the increases that NERSA in, uh, introduces are, are fairly significant. These are far outpacing the inflationary challenges of especially middle class or lower LSMs uh, that are found in these communities uh, in rural areas and again in townships. So it's, it's, it's a ticking time bomb that continues to exacerbate with time. Um, and, and add to that, there are now challenges of uh, losses of electricity through uh, the um, illegal connection of electricity. And the fact that, you know, the grid doesn't also reach some other places, uh, informal settlements where there's still a need to formalize supply of electricity in such uh, places. So this means that these are going to continue to represent a crisis that on the demand side of a segment of our population will perceive. And if you look at these communities with how they do connect themselves illegally, it does present a lot of cases of hearing about uh, little kids being electrocuted because of uh, electric lines just you know running through the uh, the streets and so on. Um, so all of these challenges, I think it's important that when we think about the electricity crisis, when we think about how do we solve it, 
uh, that we, we, we come up with an inclusive solution that is able not to leave a segment of um, our uh, South African citizens uh, out of this solution for electricity from this particular crisis. Um, the, the beauty is that with the fact that now uh, there's the bundling happening, and, and I know it can be a contentious issue uh, with different ideologies that maybe take uh, not so kindly with the fact that you know things are being uh, debundled, but I, I think it's in the right track uh, to begin to say we are now introducing a little bit of competition running right along with ESCOM and uh, about four gigawatts of um, IPPs are already uh, being worked on. Some say that actually it's even upward of um, 10 gigawatts um, owing to the difficulties of connecting to the grid. Uh, we could be sitting with very large amounts. But uh, from the um, energy resource plan, there's, there's quite a lot of good stuff that I think are put out there uh, for our consideration. And I think one of the more exciting things that probably I'm going to put emphasis on is whether we can consider uh, microgrids as a way to solve some of these problems. And I will come to talk about some of the challenges that these microgrids can present um, for these societies, especially the cost element, which, which can be fairly significant. But uh, we do need to have solutions that are going to be geared in saying, can we look at other options of how do we cater for these communities? Where over and above just perhaps fixing ASCOM as our base load, um, but we, we begin to you know, figure out some solutions that, that, that can probably take, uh, speak to the needs that we have in communities. So talking of, of how sometimes they get community, um, uh, these communities get connected, um, I spoke earlier on about um, legal connections. This is typically how you know the electric lines would just be configured, and it 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 can be fairly dangerous. I mean, I've I've worked in some of these communities and I've seen how uh, easy it is to get a lot of electric uh, uh, a lot of kids being electrocuted, uh, getting fires as a result of you know electric fires being created, and uh, all manner of challenges that you get from the fact that um, people do need electricity. And I mean. I, I look at it uh, as a human rights issue uh, for communities to have electricity that allows you to do so many things in the 21st century that otherwise wouldn't be possible. You think of uh, how you can have access to online education, how you can have access to online opportunities for um, job opportunities, uh, how you can be well integrated in this 21st century era. Uh, it, it is impossible to think of life about electricity. And in that regard, I think it, it is a human rights issue. So uh, one can, you know, maybe see fault with these communities and say, you, you know, you're connecting illegally and that's the only angle we're looking at. But it's because of the the, the demand to be connected to uh, the 21st century era. You know, you want to have your fridge connected, but you don't have your food getting spoiled. So people do need electricity. And hence, we have this amount of um, illegal connect states. So part of the proposition to say microgrids and, and microgrids, you know, you can have different energy sources coupled to these microgrids. Um, I come from a nuclear background, so preferably I would have said, you know, you put a small uh, modular reactor, but uh, understandably, uh, you want to have the right application for the right cause. And in this particular instance, it's far more important to say what sort of energy solution can best speak to the challenge that we are confronted. And amongst the solutions that we can consider is absolutely to use uh, photoelectric uh, cells, photovoltaic voltaic, um, cells, um, call them. And 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 part of you know the the what we probably need to envision is a possibility of uh, placing solar panels on every household rooftop. Um, I was doing a back of the cigarette population the other day, looking at uh, how much land we have, you know, subtracting the arable land, uh, subtracting some of the key uh, lands for government and so on. And uh, when, when you look at the amount of land and the fact that in South Africa, we have uh, some of the highest uh, solar irradiation uh, that is sitting at around 200 to about 220 watts per square meter. The implication of that is that 
uh, South Africa is one of the best places to exploit solar energy. And I think we need to we need to definitely, you know, take advantage of that and 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 go with this thing of saying, can we place solar panels on every household roof, particularly in the marginalized communities that I've mentioned before. But uh, I've I've seen also some presentation earlier on uh, from other colleagues who had described what my group are. So I will not really try and bore you with that. But the idea would be that you get about 50 households and that's just an example. You, you take about 50 households, which are uh, fairly packed close to one another, and you, you place solar panels on, on the rooftops, um, connect to some central space as part of the microgrid to distribute um, how you do the storage and how you have smart metering to regulate how the energy can be um, monitored uh, in the different households. And you could potentially connect to the national grid, but the idea with microgrids is that you could as well be isolated from the uh, from the grid, and we can talk later about you know regulations that would have to then govern how you then connect to the national grid. Because I imagine you you, you just don't want anyone to just chip into the national grid. Uh, it may create a lot of challenges at, uh, in that respect. But the point being that, that you can have some of these microgrids that can help take away some of the burden from the national grid. So this is just a simple example of. You know how you can uh, have various households uh, interconnected uh, as part of this grid. So some of the technical solutions that we probably need to take into account uh, if we were to put up such a microgrid uh, in order to serve these marginalized communities would be to say, um, <clears throat> currently the current technology on on some of the solar panels is still low, but there's there's hope that the efficiency keeps improving, and. Uh, like I said, that you know we we enjoy some of the uh, highest um, uh, irradiations from solar. Uh, that is about 200 watts per square meter. Um, the, there's going to be quite a number of issues that have to be taken into account. The fact that you're working with um, uh, direct current and you have to figure out how to share it in one location and maybe. Uh, once it's saved um, or stored, then it can be redistributed. Maybe you want to transform that electricity. But all of those are some of the issues that are being considered. And I'll, I'll maybe speak about some of the examples of other communities that are already trying this out. And, and these are some of the teething issues that I think will, will have to be resolved. But to give you a sense of what would be a typical household profile, uh, you would have a consumer that uh, basically wants to have electricity connected to a fridge, uh, maybe a deep freezer as well, um, maybe have some plugs for you know, few uh, entities such as your TV and charging your devices. Uh, and obviously you do want to connect your lights. The idea would be that, you know, you maybe once or twice um, uh, are able to use a microwave. So the idea is to, is to have a profile that is, is, is not so exorbitant in terms of usage, uh, but it is fairly modest. Uh, and if you look at some of the other needs that the household would have, such as, you know, having hot water, there we could complement this with uh, having solar geysers uh, and for cooking, uh, definitely start recommending gas stoves. And I know that in these communities, there's a lot of suspicion and fear for use of gas. So it's going to take a lot of community awareness to saying uh, when we resolve this energy crisis from the demand side among these uh, marginalized communities to orientate people on the use of gas to feel more safer uh, as they use gas, because then it does take away uh, some of the requirement in terms of um, what the profile would otherwise consume. The setup, um, quite a number of setups um, being considered, but for now, uh, the idea is that this could be a hybrid um, setup that uh, if there's a need, if you want to connect to the grid and maybe supplement some of the electricity, you can have that coming definitely from the, um, from the grid supplying the households, or you can completely go for an off-grid uh, system uh, with some backup batteries. Uh, and 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 those are some of the alternatives that uh, in in our engagements with communities, you you know they are being put forward to saying, can we look at one of these uh, as solutions that maybe people can take up? But uh, some of the requirements there is that typically you would have a five kilowatt inverter, about six panels would be covering one household. But if you do turn it into a microgrid, obviously uh, the inverter would be slightly different. Uh, but at least you still continue to have the six panels. 
And I was just asking around to get codes. Uh, they tend to uh, fairly differ, but uh, some people were saying that, you know, for this six panels with five kilowatts inverter, if it was just one single house, you could spend about 150,000 rands uh, as an investment. But the expectation is that when you begin to put it into a microgrid, you're going to have economies of scale and uh, hopefully the cost per house will come down um, a little bit more from there. And furthermore, there are some developments in terms of new technologies with um, liquid cooled batteries that you can easily utilize, especially when you have a microgrid set up. So these are all initiatives to see and you know how can we reduce the cost uh, of having this um, microgrid serving these communities. Um, all right, I'll have uh, just some more technical details in terms of you know, what they have to do if them in a uh, micro setting. Um, a lot of some of the things still uh, undergoing study development, um, but uh, the idea that current technology can be and hopeful. Bo, I think you're fading again. I hope it's not just my computer. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Looks like I have to unplug and plug every every so um yeah oh, every okay. three minutes or something. My apologies <laughs> for that. Uh, but okay. please, as soon as you don't hear me, uh, let me quickly and then I'll I'll, I'll unplug. Um, I'll okay. Continue. Okay. So um, create a case for for. Uh, solar energy. Uh, in one of the uh, sessions where I was listening to a number of people making inputs on the different energies, it was uh, heartwarming to hear, especially when you hear from professionals, engineers, and scientists, um, the realization that there is no perfect solution out there. There's always going to be challenges with any number of technologies that one utilize. And I think that is the reality of uh, utilization technology. If you walk out and say, I have a silver bullet that solves everything, um, that, that you know, we should be very doubtful when people present like that. But uh, a case for why perhaps we should uh, consider solar in the particular setup like microgrids. Uh, I've mentioned, number one, that we have favorable um, uh, irradiation uh, that, you know, uh, even sometimes twice as much as some other countries in Europe would experience. So this means that you know, we can be fairly economical in terms of how we exploit solar energy. Uh, they have a fairly quick deployment, and that is one of the big issues in energy markets. Uh, how soon can you get the system deployed? Um, because it does have implications if you take longer. And, and we've seen with um, how Kusile and Midupi have taken so many years, and you add the delays, and even today, they are not 100%. So it does give a sense of you know how 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 do you want to deploy some solutions and if you were to work with microgrids you really want quick deployments um, with uh, nuclear small uh, small um, modular reactors uh, the deployment levels there is that you know for maybe the first one that will be about five years but if you begin to have uh, a number of products that you generate as as nuclear small medium reactors you can have a deployment of about three years. So the turnaround time uh, shortens to about three years. Um, so the, the beauty with uh, uh, utilization of, of uh, solar panels is the fact that it has a quick deployment. And relative to other technology, other sources of energy, uh, it, it has an easier maintenance. And this presents a, an opportunity that I think is fairly attractive for Sparta, which is that with that uh, maintenance, it presents opportunities for job creation. Uh, with any project in engineering, we always are aware that the once you have the product done, the maintenance is going to be the big part of that economy. So in this instance, when people talk about how solar um, energy can generate a lot of job opportunities, it really centers around these issues where uh, the procurement of parts, the maintenance, uh, it creates an industry uh, in its own right. So there is an opportunity for job creation, and that's something that I think we, we, we readily need as a country. The other uh, fairly interesting thing is that you, you do not have input uh, a lot of input materials, unlike when you operate um, coal-fired power stations where you're going to need to mine and uh, have to deal with 
the environmental impact of mining, and uh, you need constant supply of your fuel. In in solar, you 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 know that the input material is limited to the capital um, cost for 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 your uh, for your system. So in that regard, it it makes it very attractive. Um, I do suspect while we're working on regulatory frameworks for uh, how we're going to work with um, renewable energy, while this is an ongoing engagement, that we are far more like have simpler uh, regulatory framework uh, with respect to um, solar, as an example. And I did mention the fact that you know it's undergoing uh, an improvement of efficiency with time, so we are far more likely to then have more uh, cheaper systems in time. And it does, I left this for last, but it's actually even more important. It does contribute to our commitment uh, to global warming. Um, the other day I had on Twitter uh, telling someone that I was going to speak to uh, at the NSTF um, dialogue and that, you know, we're talking about uh, electricity crisis and that um, we're trying to resolve global warming. And this guy, you know, in fed letters, came and said, global warming is a hoax. So there are people in our community who are still um, caught up on this notion that um, the efforts we're making towards global warming are, are, are meaningless. But uh, we have to be obviously uh, be driven by science policy. And part of that means that we recognize the fact that uh, we have to do our bit uh, to help with global warming. Um, obviously, some of the other issues that have come with um, the use of uh, uh, of of solar is is the fact that it has a high capital cost, and and there that's where we are going to need to look at interventions on how can we resolve this. And of course, it also has certain limits. It may not have limits in terms of the energy coming through, but it has limits in terms of the space through which that energy is coming through. Um, and I was doing a back of the cigarette calculation to just try and see with the current. Um, uh, with the current uh, energy, energy technology on solar, the level of, of efficiency, uh, how much land we have, you know, it was coming down to around 50, 50 gigawatts that you could just have uh, if you were to, you know, look at uh, especially homes that are putting up uh, solar. So uh, there is there is a limit. And I think for that reason, uh, it is understandable why people talk about having an energy mix to resolve our energy crisis. Um, but the other thing that it has uh, which I think is fairly attractive, um, and and you know it 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 creates another incentive of why there's a case for going with renewables and solar in particular, is the fact that fossil fuel is not going to last us forever, and sometimes this is a fact that I think people gloss over. Uh, the fact that crude oil uh, and there's differing estimates here from different studies, but you're looking at between forty and fifty years of having crude oil. And I haven't even taken into account the uh, peak analysis where you're reaching before you have the last drop of uh, crude oil coming out, you're going to reach the peak. And then the crisis um, really ex starts getting worse from the going down from the peak. But, you know, we're talking of reserves that can last 40 to 50 years. So there's a looming crisis, uh, broadly speaking, energy that is coming. Uh, and it's important that we should intensify our efforts to you know, explore other forms of energy in this particular solar as well. Um, yes, they say 50 to about 100 years. And for coal, um, if you ask ESCOM, they'll say 200 years. If you ask other people, they say you know, it can be as small as uh, 70 years. And these are, they mean, it means in a generation's time, we may not be using fossil. And, and that is something that you know, one has to let the penny drop and you know, take a moment to to internalize that and the implication of what it means, uh, not only for these marginalized communities, but for the greater South Africa. Uh, and, and it makes an argument of saying we absolutely, absolutely have to explore all these other energy options and not be caught up in ideological battles on what you support, what are you against. It's about being pragmatic and looking at what solutions can we have uh, to resolve our problems. Um, I did mention the fact that there's there's a number of people, uh, as examples, who are trying out these microgrids. Um, there's a community in midstream, right here in Gauteng, and another one in Free State. Uh, but the one in midstream in in Gauteng, um, and and you know, one had a chat with some of the guys there to understand what are some of the challenges that they're going through and what is it that they are utilizing, and their setup has something about one megawatt 
uh, of electricity availability. Uh, the idea is that it's actually about 2.5 megawatts. Um, uh, yeah, uh, megawatt hour. That's what it's uh, supposed to say there. Um, and uh, they partly use uh, ESCOM's grid. Um, they do supplement their uh, avoidance of load shedding with some diesel generators as well. Um, and in terms of cost, they are suggesting that by making that setup, the cost to customer uh, goes down from a typical 14 rands per kilowatt hour to about two rands per kilowatt hour, which makes it uh, fairly attractive. And their storage system is also highly efficient. So these are some examples of showing that, that you know it is possible to set up these systems um, to, so, to serve a small community. Um, there are other types of micro bits uh, that are being proposed. Um, I think about a month ago, uh, SAI, um, the South African uh, Pharmacy Institute, um, came to some sort of a partnership with uh, Capital C5, which is an American funding uh, entity, and a, a local company uh, that um, develops uh, nuclear power called Stratec Global. Uh, Stratec Global is led by um, a gentleman that I used to work with from PBMR, and he uh, has continued the research in into uh, small medium reactors, and they've been seeking funding for the last number of years, and it looks like things are now panning out. Uh, but typically, they also talk about uh, having microgrids that you know can be utilized, and people who are interested in this are farmers. So the idea of microgrids is is um, is being entertained by by different factors or different people uh, in the energy market out there. Uh, but yeah, they they are going for nuclear for the kind of application that they want, which I think is fairly different to what we're trying to do if we were to say we want to provide electricity for uh, communities using solar. In their case, uh, intermittent uh, limitations of solar, they become a challenge. Um, their productions are fairly cost sensitive uh, and they do need sustainable operations, not from a um, environmental side of things, but more from an economic side of side, uh, or more from the economic side of things. So it's just one example, again, that is utilizing microgrids to, to highlight the fact that there's a number of considerations for microgrids. Globally, there's about uh, 1,842 microgrids out there, uh, all contributing about 20 gigawatts. So there is traction in the space uh, to say, you know, if we go this route, uh, we are not just uh, shooting out of the dark, but, you know, there's some precedents that we can follow. Uh, with respect to the investments that are required, um, as I mentioned, we're looking at about 50 houses with, uh, let's say, a capital investment of uh, 3 million to about 5 million rands. This figure uh, still needs to be uh, recalculated because uh, we don't quite have the technical details uh, tied down. And uh, there's still a need to recalculate um, or rather recost what uh, this 50 house uh, capital investment would actually look like. But already you can imagine we're talking about marginalized communities and this 3 million hands is, is, a, is a, it's a big ask. But consider the fact that uh, the, uh, some of the communities are highly I think there is a case to be made that some of this debt um, which will actually proceed. You're, you're fading again, Paul. Thank you, Yancy. Um, okay. So I was just simply, I was simply saying that um, the, the investments that, uh, the investment incentives could be looked at from the point of view that there's a, there's a potential for municipalities to offset some of these debts and improve their bottom line. Um, considering that municipalities like uh, Soweto are owing about 28 billion rands and that, you know, the cost of electricity from some of these setups can go down to about two rands per kilowatt hour and hopefully improve with technology improving. These are prospects that I think can be fairly attractive to say, can we perhaps have uh, some investment going in this direction? And uh, however small, I find that some of these communities are actually willing to pay. It's not like they're sitting there uh, trying to, free ride the system. There, there are people who are willing to, you know, put up something. And, and the idea is for its sustenance, can we perhaps look at the way where there are modalities where maybe there's even possi possibilities of these micro generating efficient energy 
for trading amongst communities or even trading with the municipality. But these are some of the ideas of saying, you know, can we have solutions to resolve this very challenge that not many people are talking about, but it's persisting. Um, and the other beauty is that you have social innovation funders, um, particularly globally, uh, and the idea would be to tap into those um, who love our green earth and want to help invest in improving um, our reduction to warming. And of course, we can then increase uh, in, in, in the whole scheme. Uh, part of, of course of going to be needed is to really op operate from an op open energy market. And, and uh, I think operating in such a market means that, you know, free up opportunities for growth uh, in terms of, uh, you know, having SMMEs come into play roles in the energy market. Uh, and when you do consider that countries like China uh, have seen their economies grow significantly by having uh, mainly SMMEs contribute significantly to their GDP. I saw an, an OECD figure that suggested that uh, an upward of about 80% of employment, you know, can be subscribed directly from SMMEs in China and, and you know, with them contributing close to about 50% of the GDP. So there is a significant role for SMMEs to play, uh, but then it means we have to open up the energy market. Uh, and, and hence, I'm glad to see uh, the introductions of IPPs, but uh, we're going to then ensure that uh, there's good regulations that come with that. But also another issue that I think um, it's 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 fairly concerning and it, it need to be taken into account is that the the role players in this market it the, the, it has to be inclusive. Uh, some of the concerns that I think tend to be anti uh, liberalization of the energy market they stem from the fear that you're going to have um, uh, you're going to have the so-called white monopoly capital override. Um, the uh, the inclusive factor and and that's the secret fear because you know you go to GSC and look at uh, how the inclusivity looks um, there and it gives you the full picture. But here we have to be fairly intentional in saying that we want to have inclusivity and and open up the market because we 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 can't keep the market um, rigid with a monopoly or rigid concentrated by a few companies and. Uh, simply because uh, we, we 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 are unable to move forward as a result of lack of inclusivity. So, we, as a country, I think we need to we need to fairly openly talk about how we want all of us to grow in this economy, uh, and not just some few, but everybody to grow in the economy. Uh, in conclusion, um, Ms. Uh, Niehaus, uh I I want to just uh, highlight a number of issues, uh, maybe just five actually. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned earlier on, is that you know there'll be a need to have further assessment for the costing. Um, this is still an ongoing uh, development, and as a result of that, I think there's going to be constant assessments needed. Uh, we will need to re definitely resolve some of the teething technical challenges um, and uh, create some community and political awareness uh, for people to begin to have an appreciation of this as a potential solution that can help solve some of the challenges we have. Um, and the whole issue of the Department of Minerals and Energy versus the uh, climate change um, plenary, uh, that alignment is, is needed uh, so that we don't have um, poli policy uncertainty as a result of it. And yeah, we can continue to strengthen the business case for microgrids uh, by um, obviously as the technology improves, uh, have perhaps better um uh capital cost for such a such a venture uh and uh begin to engage a number of people i mean i've been talking to a number of people and i think there's there's interest in saying if this uh, you know shows promise that you know people could be willing to look at modalities and instruments of how does it get funded but of course that is something that i think we're going to have to look at uh, going forward i think that that is my conclusion and my my small contribution of just simply saying that in this energy crisis, um, there is on the demand side uh, communities that I think are going to have to be affected in how we resolve this problem as South Africa. Thank you so much, Yancy. Uh,